roses and dahlias, and people grow there. Come with horticulturist Erica Glazner as she tours American gardens. Gardens created by people who touch the earth and make it bloom. A gardener's diary is about those people. Rock star Kate Pearson always knew she wanted to be a musician. She also discovered early on that gardening was a way for her to get in touch with the earth. While her travels as a member of the B-52s take her all over the world, Kate loves coming home to her garden in upstate New York which is as colorful and lively as her performances. My first exposure to gardening it was uh, my aunt and uncle's farm in Blairstown, New Jersey. They had a, a dairy farm. I used to go there in the summers and they, that was my first exposure to really great tasting food as well. And they'd have this array of vegetables on the table. And my aunt grew rhubarb, and she'd make rhubarb pie, and all sorts of things that seemed very exotic to me, you know, I had never seen. And so that was, you know, my, my I was really turned on to gardening by, by her. And I didn't, I wasn't so much into gardening as just the natural world. I've always been very, very attuned to, um, you know, watching birds and just being outdoors, being in the natural world. I love that sunflower with the morning glory. Oh yeah, it's great, that russet color with the heavenly blue. You've got to have a border of heavenly blue. There aren't as many blooming this morning, I think, because it's not as sunny, maybe, but um, there are tons and tons of buds here, as you can see, and we have the purple butterfly bush peeking out here, and this has swallowed up the um, spring border, which we had Siberian irises and daffodils and um, some crocuses and we had a really nice spring border and then this was designed to kind of just swallow that up and with all the grasses and we've got some cherry tomatoes peeking through there and and it covers um, up it's a great screen for your deer fence yes this is drought resistant deer resistant and it's also meant to be late season and we have this wonderful shisho leaf I don't know what the other name for Perilla. this Perilla. And this is uh, also used in Japan a lot for cooking. And I just finished this Japanese project, um, Nina, with a, a band that I'm in in Japan and here. And they're Japanese. And they came over here and they were cooking and they tasted this. They were all excited. It's growing there. <laughs> it's volunteered in the yard too. And they, they picked it up and tasted it and they went, hmm same so they used it they made rice balls and wrapped them in shisho leaf it oh they wrapped delicious. them in? yeah and they use it as a seasoning it's, it's fabulous so i have plenty of that yes you do and i like how you can just get just glimpses of what's inside the garden yeah i was contemplating what i was going to study in college and i wanted to be a musician but there was that always that you know you better study something else just in case and i wanted to study horticulture but there was obviously some yearning in me. I think a lot of it was from the farm and from my grandmother and being around these amazing gardens. But I think there's also this, you know, just tremendous love of nature and the outdoors. I think a lot of writers and actors like gardening because it, it offers this solace, you know, and this kind of wonderful solitude, too. How did you decide to put this type of structure here with the... It's a clever way to use the fence, I guess, to keep the deer out, but yeah. then you've got a beautiful, natural, I don't know what it's made out of, but. It's cedar, actually. I and thought, I've yeah. always loved Adirondack style, kind of the twisty branches, and he did the gate, but he made this arbor, and this clematis, and moonflower, and Dutchman's pipe, and all these things that intertwined over the, the uh, trellis, which I just think is the most grand entrance to the garden, very romantic and the way the clematis intertwines. Clematis has always been one of my favorite Me too. plants. And also, the roots are there, so they're well shaded. You know, clematis likes shaded roots and sunny tops. Top, so. And a little bit of formality with the stone. I guess that must be from this region. Yes, this is all bluestone, native bluestone. All the bluestone that you see in New York City and St. Patrick's Cathedral and a lot of sidewalks and all is, is usually from this region. This garden is very American, but I love Japanese gardens. And I love the kind of stonework that is involved in Japanese gardens. And, and we tried to sort of recreate a 
sort of stone path. Of, well, that's kind of, that's a good way to get that feeling in, but keep it American. I mean, yeah. I think that's the problem. People try to take Japanese and apply it to yeah. upstate yeah. New York, and it doesn't work. It but doesn't. this this is great. In Japan, I noticed a lot of the gardens and houses there. The doorway has this kind of enclosed feeling. There's a lot of times a garden at the entrance, and it makes you feel like you're in a little garden room before you enter the house. And I always like little things overhanging, you know, the gate, so you almost have to duck down to get in there. It's sort of, I don't know if that's Japanese, but everything's not revealed at the same moment. You've yeah. got to look a little further. And yeah. Kate Pearson's summertime garden in the Catskill Mountains of New York is as colorful and imaginative as Kate herself. The functional structures in her garden reflect her love for the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and Augustus Stickley, and the framed views of the garden owe much to the Japanese tradition, also an influence in her design. This garden's been going on for 12 years, and it's been a collaboration, and William who was an old friend of mine from Georgia. He did the structure of the gate, the fences, and then he also did these beds, raised beds, and that was, it was built all on the basis of having raised beds. One of the things about your garden that I think is a great idea, it's not a very big space and it's on a slope, but you've, you let tomatoes, little cherry tomatoes grow right up through flowers and vines and yeah. you've got it all together, but it works. Well, the idea of this garden was to be actually a vegetable garden but of course you just got to have some flowers and phlox is my favorite favorite flower because my grandmother grew phlox and I remember the smell of it we can't have any flowers outside the garden out of the fence because the deer will just snap them right up it's just breakfast food for them and so you have to have the flowers contained within the vegetable garden so it's also good for companion planting and it makes for a more beautiful garden it and does and I like the terraced beds and the way you've used the rock to outline them. The raised beds are incredibly rich. We've done a lot of... Uh, Soil amendment. Yes, and we mulch. That's like the big key to this garden and why it's thriving where a lot of gardens now in the drought are wilting because, you know, it's heavily mulched and it remain, you know, the moisture is retained in the soil, so, so everything's well. thriving. Well, I bought this house in 1987 and my first goal was to start a garden. And no sooner had I bought this house than I met Dean Riddle. And I proposed the idea of him coming up and doing a garden for me, or wouldn't it be a great idea? And several years later, he moved up here to start my garden. And he lived in the house for about six months and just intensively started working on it. I was coming from definitely the point of view of a vegetable gardener. Dean was coming from a totally different point of view, and he was much more about native planting, and he was into woodland plants, and so we put our heads together, and we wound up really starting the vegetable garden with a lot of ornamental plants and a border. Dean had never gardened in the north, east, and he had never gardened where there's a lot of deer ready to eat up your garden, so he had to do a lot of research, and both of us had to find out a lot of times the hard way <laughs> what what things deer liked and deer don't like. Well, you get a lot of production out of a small space here and you've got yeah, this it's beautiful very intensive. We got the scarlet runner bean blooms with the verbena here. We've got two types of beans. Yeah, we planted scarlet runner beans just for color, but um, they're not that delicious to me to eat. But they're so beautiful that it's just nice to have on the ends we put scarlet runner beans. You know. This is a beautiful cucumber and it's, I realize now that they do have a natural, a slightly waxy coating. You get those in the store and they put oh, that yeah. wax on them. I hate that. I hate I that when they wax things or wax apples and you have to peel them. And the skin is actually one of the best parts. So you eat the skin of this? Oh yeah, yeah. I have a, a great Japanese knife I bought in Japan and I just slice it. Um, very thin, sort of slant-wise, and then I put it in rice vinegar, or you can use any kind of vinegar, and a little bit of water, and I put salt, of course. It's good to salt them heavily, and then cover them with vinegar and water, and you can put 
dill or whatever else you want to put in there and just let them soak overnight and um, they just turn out delicious delicious little garnish for your meal what variety yeah. is this this is Chelsea prize and this is the size plant you get yeah they're they're all staked they're busting out of their cages though look at this little flower I really like that yeah that's where that's the fruit pretty. comes from yeah and then then you get your Chelsea prize they're That's beautiful. They're really delicious cucumbers. They're some of the best tasting cucumbers. And they, they can grow quite large and still be delicious, too. You know, people have lost touch with how good food can taste. And I know a lot of people that don't eat vegetables because their experience growing up has been with canned vegetables. And if they could taste, you know, just delicious, fresh-grown produce, you know, it would just be, it would amaze them. Although she now lives in upstate New York, the B-52's Kate Pearson never lost her fondness for the southern vegetables she grew in Athens, Georgia. A vegetarian and advocate of organic gardening, she intertwines her vegetable and flower gardens in a way that is both decorative and functional. It's a circuitous route I came to gardening, but I was traveling through Europe after college doing my obligatory tour of Europe and I wound up staying almost a year and a half and I met my future ex-husband in Ireland and this avenue opened up to move to Georgia. We found this place for $15 a month. It was in the middle of a field, kind of like the love shack <laughs> and you could see from the outhouse had three sides and one open side you looked out into a cow field so it was just so beautiful. I didn't have running water and I had uh, no heat but wood-burning stove and I was just absolutely idyllically happy and we had this big big garden and got all these organic gardening manuals and I just studied and I poured over them and we did it by the book you know we were just full-time into this back to the land thing we had goats and we made goat cheese and uh, we did a lot of canning I put up 80 quarts of tomatoes and I put up collard greens and just cans and cans and cans of, of produce. I was just amazed, you know, this is just like this amazing uh, discovery that you could live off of this, you know, with the bounty of the earth. This is a big kale? Collard, yeah. collard, collard greens. Oh, you can tell I didn't grow up oh eating God. these. Georgia collards. I love collard greens. It's one of my favorite things. It's better to take the ones at the bottom first because then oh. they'll, they'll just keep growing and growing. You know, they'll just keep putting out more leaves. This wouldn't be and, too um, rough to eat? No, I don't take, I don't tear the leaves off. Uh, some people tear the leaves off the stem here, but I take them like this and roll them. This is John Taylor Hop and John taught me this. And then you slice them, slice them like that. And then you um, put in a nice big uh, seasoned cast iron frying pan. You put a little olive oil, and then you put these in the olive oil. Right. Toss them around a little bit. And then you can add a little water and a little vegetable broth and uh, sort of steam them. So it's a and light saute steam. Yeah. And they're fabulous that way. <laughs> fabulous. These are so good. I have to have collard greens. They're rich in vitamins, too. You know, very rich in vitamins. So is that one of the first vegetables you grew? Yeah, I grew these in Georgia. I ate them every day, and I still love them. <laughs> and they do well in yeah, upstate New York. Yeah, they thrive here. I mean, the season's a lot shorter. They don't grow all winter here, but they grow well into the fall, so I can, you know, pick them even after the frost. Some people say they taste better after frost, so. It looks like two different types of beets, but you're much more knowledgeable about vegetables. I've never grown a beet. I don't like them, but they're pretty. Oh, I love beets. Well. Basically, we have white beets and red beets here, and, and they make a fabulous When We just had them the other day. We uh, boiled them and then plunged them in cold water and took the skins off and just drenched them in a little bit of olive oil and salt and pepper. And, and they're good? Oh, they were fabulous. Maybe they look great. Maybe I haven't great. had them prepared the right way. Yeah. When do you know to harvest them? Is when they're sticking out of the ground like this? Yeah, they've been ready for quite a while now. They're so beautiful, and the tops are also good for juicing. I do a lot of juicing, so... You juice the actual... the the stalks and yeah, leaves? Yeah, And that's just lots of vitamins. Yeah. Does and it also, taste nasty? If you put too much, too much greens, you know, too many greens in, uh, we'll make it taste a little, you know, So this gritty. is the white, and even though it's got this green up here, that is, it's still ripe. Yeah, when you um, cut it and cook it, um, it'll kind of have a creamy 
sort of look and texture. But yeah, when sort of when they get big enough, that's how you can tell to harvest them, and they kind of rise up from the ground a little bit. And they've, as I said, they've been ready for a while. But you can leave these in the ground for, I mean, even through autumn. Oh, really? And st keep harvesting them. I've grown this for ornamental interest in my own garden, but never to eat. Swiss chard. Swiss chard. <laughs> well, I love Swiss chard. It's also one of my favorite greens are my thing you know but really this good. is again a crop i think i could only grow in the cool season so this is august and you will harvest these until yeah. these the fall. keep going yeah these keep, if you cut them you know they just keep on coming they're great and i love these in colors and with the beets and the marigolds and the coleus coleus it's, it's a nice little touch and your big tomatoes are right back there against the fence wow yeah we have several stands of tomatoes and the, the jet star tomatoes uh, are really big tomatoes over there and they've already ripened and some of those have ripened as well so we've had some tomatoes already which is unusual to usually they ripen quite late here and a lot of times I'm gone just when they ripen it drives me crazy a lot of people in, in the Catskills are musicians and artists and it's just a real balancing thing to be able to come home and have something very grounding and something also that involves you out in the outdoors i find that the garden is this amazing magnet just working in the garden is very calming and comforting and grounding and when you've been traveling and been on a plane and all these unnatural environments it's it's wonderful to come back to Kate Pearson's life on the road with the B-52s can be hectic. She always looks forward to returning to the tranquility of her garden in upstate New York. And if she's lucky, she'll be home when her favorite vegetables are ready to harvest. Here we are <laughs> in upstate New York in August. It's high summer and you have nasturtiums. That just makes people like me very envious because I couldn't we could only grow these as a cool season crop. Yeah, I mean in Georgia the growing season is so much longer and I had a lot more yield for my squash and tomatoes, but I have to say here things when they do um, bloom and when they do produce it's so crisp and clear and vigorous and there's not enough time for a lot of mold and things to set in and, and for even a lot of insects to take hold. So it's kind of a really perfect, perfect climate. Do you eat these little nasturtiums? Oh yeah. Salad is my favorite food and we usually have a big bed of mescaline mix and you know lots of arugula and so it's always good to you know sprinkle nasturtiums. I know the flowers have sort of if I remember a peppery taste but do you eat the flowers and the leaves or do you just eat the flowers? I don't know. I've eaten the leaves before but I usually just put the flowers in in with the salad but I love this in with the kale because I also love kale and then we have some okra here which doesn't the season's really not long enough here for okra to thrive, but we do, I love the flower, and we do get a few okra. Everyone that can have a garden for themselves, even if it's growing herbs on their windowsill, uh, you know, it's really a great thing to be able to have that experience, but it's also much better for your health if you can grow your own fruits and vegetables. There's also nothing like taking stuff fresh from the garden. You feel the nutrients just soaking into you when you can eat something directly from the garden. It's just amazing. Do you think your garden has evolved the way your music has evolved? I think it definitely just gets more refined, just like sometimes music gets more refined. You start out totally wild, and hopefully you keep that wildness, that wild element in the garden, too, and in your music as well. Look at that color on that sunflower. Oh, I know. That sunflower seeds are extremely healthy to eat if they're fresh so if you get a chance oh. to grow them and eat them so when do you fresh, harvest them when they you know when the seeds kind of start sticking out start in. sticking out and get before the birds get them yeah usually the birds get them though i kind of like to feed the birds attract the birds here just sitting in the garden is just the mo one of the most amazing aspects of the garden because you're forced to slow the whole world can slow down and you can observe very small things you can observe a bee or a little hummingbird and things almost go in slow motion because you just feel sort of at one you know with the world when you feel very at one with nature and I think people feel very divorced from nature living in the city and here you know being in the garden you just 
see it all surrounding you. So it's the whole way of life, I think, having a garden. It's not just a hobby. I think gardeners get into it as a philosophy and, you know, a whole way of living. <laughs>